Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Russ Fustino. I'm a developer advocate for Algorand. The last South Florida conference um, was the last one we did, I think, pre-COVID. Uh, I packed up the uh, tablecloth, the Algorand tablecloth and the banner, and I've had it in my shed the whole time and brought it out. This is the first place it's saw again, you know, so uh, come full circle, you know, come out to this great uh, community over here. Round of applause for this whole uh, conference. Really doing a great job. So uh, we got a killer session here for you today. I'm building dApps. And uh, it's funny because when I wrote the title up, it came back as apps. And uh, so I was communicating with the organizer. I said, no, it's dApps. There's a D in front of it. You know, it's for decentralized, decentralized apps. And uh, the title is for JavaScript but I'm extending it to C Sharp, Go, Python today, just for you, because I know we got a, a good crowd here, a lot of different languages. And another alternative title for this session might be, have we found Nirvana, you know, for blockchain developers. And uh, so let's go ahead and get into this and what developers really need to know. Uh, and I'm just curious, how many folks here are fairly new to blockchain, show of hands? Good number of you. How many have actually heard of Algorand before? Wow, that's awesome, that's awesome, that's great, that's great. Uh, and, uh, you know, whenever I do something uh, new in particular, that's like the first question I ask, well, what pr programming languages can I use? Uh, you know, and then we got, you know, what's ADAP anyway? We're gonna answer that in more detail. And I love, uh, you know, insert favorite programming language here. Uh, somebody yell at their favorite language. C sharp. How many C sharp fans out here? Show of hands. Well, that's a good number. And anybody else? JavaScript. What was that? JavaScript. JavaScript. Okay. How about Python? Any Python devs? A few of you? Okay. Well, we got quite a few out there, right? And then also we got, you know, how can I build a DAP and then verifying smart contracts, all this good stuff. We're going to explain all this for everybody here. What about C sharp and all the rest of the stuff? So the agenda for the next hour, we're going to show you, talk about Algorand at a high level and blockchain at a high level. Uh, we're going to set up our development environment. Uh, we're actually going to create a simple DAP uh, before your very eyes. And then also uh, talk about verification and how important that is, especially with, with smart contracts. Uh, we also have a great ecosystem, and a lot of the tools I'm showing are part of the ecosystem. And uh, one of them is Pipeline UI, and they have a, a set of controls that work with Java and JavaScript and, and React. And uh, so that's a really great tool to build front ends with. And then also, um, there's a brand new, this is going to be first time ever seen live. This is a new Algo Studio extension for Visual Studio uh, using C Sharp. So it's file new and you guys will have a, a template ready to go for smart contracts, which is just killer. I'm so excited about this. It's, uh, this is in beta and there's gonna be more templates coming out right now, it's a console app, but uh, that's where we're gonna bring things to a crescendo, you know, in this, in this session. So that's the, the last demo of the day that we're gonna do. And also talk about the ecosystem in general. So blockchain, so those, for those that are new, what a blockchain is, it's basically a, um, decentralized ledger, as opposed to a centralized data store, right? It's a data center. Everything is under lock and key, right? And if you get the lock and key and you get the lock and you're the wrong person, what happens typically? Ransomware attacks, you know, we hear about those every day. And by having the data on a blockchain, it's public and accessible, so that eliminates the need to have ransomware because everybody can get at it, all right? So that's one, one problem solved right away with blockchain. Also, transactions are between a sender and a receiver. There's no middleman. And, and that really makes it very, very efficient. You can do transactions globally in under five seconds, no matter where you are in this planet, which is phenomenal. So basically, the makeup of a blockchain is you have a distributed ledger uh, that can be replicated anywhere you want. And anybody can have a copy of it. All you got to do is create a node, and you got your own copy of that ledger. So what is in the ledger? Well, it's very simple. Uh, it's not really rocket science here. You got blocks, which are a slice in time. It could be five seconds or so until the next block is created. And then during that time interval, you have transactions that occur. All right, and those are recorded as part of that time period or part of that block. 
Now, transactions are between who? Sender and a receiver, right? Accounts. And each account has the ability to have assets or fungible or non-fungible tokens, NFTs, or applications, you know, which would be smart contracts. And that's the lay of the land. So very, very simple in terms of uh, what's actually in the blockchain. And in terms of Algorand itself, we have what's called a pure proof of stake protocol. And uh, Silvio McCauley um, is our founder. He won a Turing Award for his work in hashing algorithms. And a lot of that smarts went right into our, our blockchain in terms of the, the hashing algorithms that are used when we're generating blocks and accounts and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so true scalability. And I got to update my slide because we're actually up to 10,000 transactions per second, which is, you know, MasterCard kind of volume. And so th this is really important, as well as the length of time for a block is under five seconds. Now, help me, let, me, let me ask two, two more questions. Who here has created a production app with either Algorand or any other blockchain? Okay, Ethereum? Okay, so Ethereum block times are how long? Long time, right? So it could be minutes, several minutes, right? Also, you got, uh, you know, throughput, you know, is, is, is big. You want these things to really have a lot of good throughput. And so with uh, that, you got scalability. A lot of infrastructure, longevity, technical flexibility with lots of SDKs. Transaction certainty is important. There's no forking. You know, everything it gets written out there is committed. Uh, instant transaction finality. Really a very extensible platform and uh, extremely energy efficient. This is another big ticket item, all right, because you got proof of work for Ethereum, Bitcoin, lots of uh, energy is used, right? That's a big knock on Bitcoin is the fact that it uses so much energy to, to mine these blocks. We don't do any mining in Algorand. We just use ma simple math to determine the next uh, block for the, uh, the protocol census. So it's very, very green. Uh, cost efficient, another big bonus for Algorand. This is a modern blockchain. This is a long story short here with Algorand. It's a 20th of a penny to do a transaction as opposed to, what are your transaction fees in Ethereum? Like 20 bucks, <laughs> something like that. You know, and it really cramps your ability to do uh, software solutions. And, um, you know, having the, the right mix here for everything is really great, you know, and you got true security as we're going to show you through as we go through this uh, particular uh, exercise here today. So a lot of good things here with uh, with the pure proof of stake, and the ecosystem is, is really growing large. Uh, I joined Algorand just just under three years ago, and it, right about that time, a month after I joined, we went mainnet, and so we haven't had any downtime, you know, whatsoever. So that's another uh, big big item. We got a great engineering team you know, uh, that is constantly improving and, and making uh, revisions and rolling out uh, new consensus uh, uh, versions. So let's get down to layer one. Uh, I was talking to a few at the booth about what's layer one, what's layer two, that sort of thing. Layer one is right on the blockchain. It's part of the consensus algorithm, uses the consensus algorithm to go ahead and, and, and build uh, these applications. So what's involved there? Well, you got at a basic, uh, basis, Algorand accounts, ASAs or Algorand standard assets. Well, those are your, your uh, fungible tokens, non-fungible tokens. Atomic transactions are, are part of the mix, guaranteed uh, delivery. And then uh, Algorand smart to uh, contracts. We'll go over each of these in the indexer. So three different types of accounts. First is a standard account. So it could be like an individual, for example. A multi-sig account is made up of uh, more than one person, right? So you can have like a group of people. Like an example might be a board of directors, right? And you want to get maybe a threshold of five or more, right? That sign off on it, and then this will be good to go. So you de decide, you know, how big the group is, who's in it, and what your threshold is. Those are, you know, the parameters that would go into that type of a, an account. And then you got Logic Sig account, which is a smart contract. And this either is, returns true or false. If it returns true, it's going to go ahead and write out that uh, block, that transaction to the blockchain. If it returns false, it does not. So it's based on logic. So drilling into each of these a little bit, ASAs are fungible tokens uh, as well as uh, restricted, both fungible and restricted fungible. So the restricted ones would involve some kind of clawback capability. With fung fungible tokens, examples of those would be 
uh, cryptocurrencies, right? Algorand has its own cryptocurrency called Algo. You know, you got um, anytime you want to create a, a, a cryptocurrency, you can just create a, I'll show you how to do it. Actually, my first demo, you know, you, you can create a, a fungible a, a token and this, every token is identical. You create like lots of them, right? And now, now you've got those as available for use for whatever you want. Similarly, you can use this in games, right? For loyalty points or, uh, you know, one of the problems we've had with cryptocurrency is the fact that it fluctuates a lot. So it really is tough to do transactions when it fluctuates so much. Well, one thing that uh, has solved that somewhat is our stable coins. Stable coins are tied to the U.S. economy. So they fluctuate with the economy. So that makes it really good for doing transactions now because you're used to that that type of a scenario when you're doing transactions outside of a blockchain. So a lot of good things happening there. And then on the other side, NFTs are hot and uh, NFTs are really great. I, I, the way I like to think of those, the collectibles is probably the best example, right? Uh, they're unique. They're, you know, you can have a, a baseball card collection, right? And the card could be worth depending on the, the condition it's in, the player it was, the year it was issued. And there's a lot of metadata around every one of those collectibles, which makes them unique. Uh, real estate is a good example too, where you have basically you can have two uh, two bedroom condos in, in different parts of town, but again there's different metadata around them. One's got shops, the other one doesn't. One's easy to get to the expressway, the other one isn't. That sort of thing. So these all build in to make that particular thing unique, and that's what a, a NFT is all about. There was even a skit on Saturday Night Live not too long ago about NFTs. Anybody happen to see that one here? That was uh, that was pretty. You know, you've made the mainstream when you're in a skit, you know, on Saturday Night Live. That was it. That was uh, uh, an awakening moment for me. All right, so let's take a look at creating one of these. We're going to use a tool called Algodesk IO. How many developers here, and how many are non-developers that are just here for management purposes or whatever your purpose is? Okay, a few of you just getting the lay of the land. Well, this is not a coding solution. This is a visual solution. So what we're going to do is build an asset before your very eyes. And we're gonna, there are different wallets you can hook up to. The Para wallet is the one that um, is the official Algorand wallet that runs in an iOS and Android. Okay, so that's the one you wanna download. If you're buying coins on like Coinbase or something like that, or buying algos there, what you wanna do is transfer those algos into the Para wallet so you have your own private key, right? Uh, if you have it like on Coinbase, they're, they're custodians of the private key. You never get it. So if anything ever happens to Coinbase, you're really hosed, right? So you really want to be in complete control of your funds. So the best way to do that is to download that from, you know, wherever exchange you're buying uh, crypto at and then uh, transfer, create a new account in the wallet and then do a transfer to that account. So anyway, we're going to use AlgoSigner, which is a plugin here for Chrome. Also, MyAlgo is a web-based uh, wallet. And... Once we're doing that, then we're going to go ahead and grant access. We're going to use this account I got in the wallet, and we're going to go ahead and create a new asset. So let's call this the Russ name. The unit name would be Pizza. And let's say we want to do 1,000 of these Russ coins. Well, you can make 10,000, as many as you want. And also you can assign uh, 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 digitals, uh, I mean, uh, digits. So you can say, okay, 100,000 point two. You know, or point point zero zero or whatever. If you did two two de uh, um, decimals, you also have the ability to put a URL in. Maybe you got uh, data stored in um, IPFS that you want to point to if you're you know creating something or something up in a website or something like that about your your particular coins. And then these are all different asset management uh, capabilities. You have. Uh, uh, a role for the overall manager, a role for the reserves, a role for freezing, and a role for clawback. You can also specify a node on these. And so uh, this is way cool. And you can also put other things in there, like, jo like uh, JSON uh, files, right? And so anything that's tailored maybe to your uh, application. So any kind of structure or things like that. So you have a lot of flexibility there in how you use that. It's free form. Uh, let's go ahead and create this asset. So we're going to go ahead and sign it. And go ahead and create that asset. Now we're going to wait for the confirmation 
Typically, again, that's under five seconds. And then uh, once you see that, there it is. So there's our transaction. Now there's this button here to view it. So you can instantly browse these through some of the, there's some uh, uh, explorers out there. This is one of them. This is Algo Explorer. And you can see here, this is set to test net. There's other environments. You can go to main net. That's the real deal, beta net for new, new uh, features coming up. But here you can see everything that we just did. It created that transaction. There's the asset name, Russ. There's the unit name, Pizza. This is the only thing that's unique about it. You get a unique asset ID. So that is your asset ID that you just created. And then you have all the other functions that we talked about. And then if you look at the text, there it is. This is way cool. That's what came through in that uh, note field. Then also what you could do is you can copy this transaction ID if you want. And then uh, there is actually other uh, browsers out there. Let's take a look at one more. This is uh, Goal Seeker by PureStake. And both of those tools, this one here and um, uh, Algo Explorer have developer portals. So they actually have uh, services that they spin up nodes and you can actually point at those nodes. You don't have to create your own node to do development work. And so that's a nice scenario, especially if you're doing like mobile apps where you can't really have a local host, you know, running with the phone. That it'd be nice to point to that somewhere else. So they have uh, these service that, services that you can do something just like that. And there it is. So now we're going to go ahead and put in our... Uh, transaction and there's the same transaction we found so this is something I really like about uh, blockchain development like your results are instantaneous you can just verify it very very easily that everything's working right as a developer uh, and you know through the use of these uh, these tools like browsers so let's talk about atomic transfers so with atomic transfers all must succeed or all will fail and uh, it, this is one of those things that uh, you know, this is very, very important because really what you want to do is guarantee, guarantee your exchange of goods. And, you know, if you ever buy something, you always tend to be more inclined to buy something if you know the person that you're, you're working with, right? There's a, a relationship there that's built. Well, that's not necessarily the case with blockchain. You could be, you know, doing something with someone on the other side of the planet you've never met before. So really what you want to do is guarantee this exchange of goods. So, for example, if person A is going to spend 50 algos in an attempt to get a concert ticket, then person B is going to send the concert ticket. That's a round trip. Everybody's happy. But if person B doesn't send the contract ticket, person A is not going to lose that 50 algos, right? So it's guaranteed all the way around. All of it's got to succeed or none of it does. So that relieves a lot of stress on the part of doing transactions by relying on this. And not only that, this is combined with, with other Algorand technologies, with smart contracts, with the assets I just showed you. And this really is the secret sauce to build a solution many times is wrapping uh, many different uh, tasks into one big atomic transaction. And that really is very, very important when you're, when you're building solutions to get to kind of get a grasp of that. And examples of atomic transfers include uh, efficient match funding, uh, multilateral trades, circular trades, group payments, uh, instant settlement for complex multi-party asset transactions and distributed payments. And then we get the smart contract. So transaction execution pro approval language, or TEAL, is at the base of all of these that I'm about to talk about. TEAL is the short name for it. This is assembly language. Who here has done assembly language before? few of you have. All right, that's great. I actually started my career many years ago <laughs> writing assembly language. And here I am at the twilight years and I'm doing assembly language again. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's a reason for that. Uh, it's got to be efficient. It's got to be lean and mean and fast, you know, on a blockchain. It's got to be performant. And there are tools that generate teal for you. You know, that's the good news for everybody that didn't put their hand up. You don't have to learn assembler, you know. Uh, but, Take a look at these tools that we got. They're really good. One of them is a Python-enabled compiler, or PyTeal, for the Python devs out here. So basically, you create your, your, um, your contract in Python. And then there's a compiler at the end, a compile uh, method that will go ahead and generate the teal, or assembly language, that you can use. Reach is a very cool tool. I was talking to a few of you about the, at the booth. Uh, that's even a higher level abstraction, all right, for, for development uh, of smart contracts and, and dApps. And so with Reach, basically you write the code once. Uh, there's a front end and back end on it. 
but you can deploy to multiple blockchains. So I know you were saying you're working with Ethereum and sometimes you might get stuck working that, that route at first. Well, consider using Reach because then you can not only deploy to Ethereum with that, you can also deploy to Algorand and some other blockchains. So uh, there's a, a really good uh, a thing here with Reach. I'm going to go into depth with that. That was really originally my main focus for this entire session, but there's so much here I want to show you and, and seeing how most are, are new here. Uh, today, we're going to cover a little bit more than just the Reach product. And then uh, I'm going to end, like I said, with this new Visual Studio extension for C Sharp that um, uh, is quite, quite amazing. And then we got smart signatures and smart contracts. So the, uh, the signatures approve the spending transactions, you know, the thing where it's, if it's true or false. And then smart contracts also have the ability to do transactions provide global state for the entire blockchain, or you can do local state based on the account. So if you have like a counter or something, you got to keep track for an account, or if they already did something on an account, you can store that in local state for uh, account specific uh, things. These are all combinable with other Algorand technologies, atomic transfers, assets, and smart contracts and signatures. So let's talk about AVM and what that is. It stands for Algorand Virtual Machine. It's the consensus network observes when a smart contract app calls a transaction. So it sends it to the execution environment. The execution environment is commonly known as a virtual machine. And it's a runtime within the consensus protocol. So what does that mean? Well, a smart contract program logic is executed and evaluated. And either include that transaction in the next block or discard it altogether if the evaluation fails. Evaluation fails. So very, very simple in terms of uh, what's going on here, and uh, that's how it actually gets executed. So we have more information that on our developer portal. I have a link to the slide deck at the end, so you'll be able to get all of these links that I have on, on all these slides. Now, in terms of a DAP architecture, uh, again, decentralized application, what we're talking about is you might be having on the front end or, or UI layer, uh, maybe a smart signature using maybe Algorand as it has several SDKs. We have Go, Python, Java, JavaScript are the four that we support. And then there's a bunch more that are uh, supported by the community out there in the ecosystem like C Sharp and Rust and PHP and Swift and a lot more. And then you also have uh, the REST APIs that go along with that. But there's three different transaction types. One would be a payment. So that would be between accounts, right? We talked about that. But then you also got the ability to transfer assets, right? So that could be fungible tokens or non-fungible tokens. And then you got application calls as well that would be providing uh, the smarts from a smart contract, the logic, and then uh, the ability to store local state at the account level or global state at the blockchain level. And that's a really simplistic diagram of what's going on in terms of the transactions. Then finally, on layer one, we have an indexer, which is good for reporting. So basically it offloads uh, the data into a database, a PostgreSQL database. So we have all robust queries and, and capabilities to get at the data very easily if you're building reports or consuming data after the fact. All right, so set up your develop development environment. First and foremost, you want to go out to the developer portal, or developer.algorand.org. Get familiar with it. There's a lot of great tutorials and getting started. There's a whole section on, you know, even if you're brand new to blockchain, you know, go here. And also you have, um, there's a great couple of really great servers. One's the Algorand Discord server and the other one's Reach. If you're going to be using Reach, they, they have their own server as well. And uh, these are where you get your answers. Um, it's fantastic. The, the Algorand Discord, uh, I think um, we're about 30,000 30, people are on that now, 10,000 of which are developers, which is pretty darn cool. So again, this is over the period of a couple of years, you know, this is really uh, taken off. And then also, um, Sandbox is a great tool. So remember I said, you, got, you know, sometimes you want to run your own node to be able to, you know, program against it, that sort of thing. Well, you can do that. There's a, you know, we have instructions on how to create your own node. It's very, very simple, actually. Uh, but this is even better because this is a, a will create a uh, an instance for you in a sandbox or in a Docker instance. Okay, so it's very easy. You just install Docker. You clone the the GitHub uh, repository for Algorand dash slash sandbox. And then you can start accessing any of the networks. You've got a private network as well as a beta net, test net, main net. You do sandbox up test net and you're up and running and you have a node that you can program to. So it's pretty straightforward. Now I'll show you, there's two pieces you need when you program, the token and the URL, and you get both of those in the readme file. It's always consistent with Docker. Code tools, lots of SDKs, 
Uh, everything circled in red is done by Algorand. All the rest is all ecosystem. Uh, but again, you got uh, the four SDKs like I talked about, plus you got Teal, uh, which is a smart contract language, and PyTeal is also an Algorand product to help you uh, build um, uh, uh, those type of solutions. So let's take a look at uh, the Python, PyTeal first here. So this is an example of the Python. And then you go to uh, compile it, and then this is what your assembly language looks like that it generates for you. And so let's go ahead and take a look at these. All right, so this is a, a PyTeal uh, application for the Python uh, developers here. And basically the first thing you do is you're going to import the PyTeal library, and, and then you're going to set up uh, any parameters that are going to be used in this particular contract. So you got timeout values, you got amounts, you got here's an address that we're going to be using in, in the contract. So these are all the template variables. Uh, and then uh, we're going to come down here, we're going to do a pay trans transfer. So you got the sender, the receiver, the amount. Uh, and then uh, this last uh, piece here, we're going to go ahead and close out the account and then uh, put, uh, create the escrow in the last uh, uh, statement right there. And then we're going to use this magic verb here to compile teal. That's part of the PyTeal uh, SDK. So when I go ahead and run that, now you see all the teal that gets generated down here uh, below. So that's uh, PyTeal. Now, the other thing I want to show you is the Python uh, SDK. And again, there, there's the equivalent in Java, JavaScript, Go, uh, really all, you know, all the ecosystem ones as well. But I just want to show you the basics for doing them. This is where you start using those nodes. Like this one here, if I had Sandbox running, uh, it would be the one here with all the A's in it right here and the, the port uh, local host. Uh, I'm using a stand-up instance here for the... Um, um, Network Academy that we do all our demos with at Algorand and so I'm just going to run this and uh, again I got the breakpoints preset so we'll talk about these when we hit it. So there's the uh, address and the token. Uh, the next step we're going to do now is instantiate this client, uh, this algo client from that token and so now what we'll be able to do is uh, like uh, take uh, method calls like here we're getting the, uh, the account info for, the, for this address that we have. And uh, what we can do is print off that, that balance, right, from that account. So right now it's zero because we created a brand new account here. And so what we got to do is actually fund that account. So we're going to use a testnet dispenser to do that, give us some algos. And then once that's done, uh, you'll see, uh, I think it'll issue five algos here. You can also use this for USDC, which is that stable coin, if you're doing any testings there. So we're going to type in yes, we got the funding. And now we're going to uh, go ahead and um, print that out. So now you can see we got five algos. And this, this uh, comes back in micro algos. That's why it looks like five million. Uh, so we have a receiver, uh, a sender, an amount. Uh, we're putting hello world in a note. But this is the three, these are the three steps you're always going to do for uh, um, a transaction. Number one is the payment itself. Number two is signing it, right, from the, the sender account. And number three is then broadcasting it to the blockchain, right? Those are the three steps that are always involved. And it looks similar in every other um, example on, um, on the Algorand site. So they are, they are, and then we're going to go ahead and do that. And then we're going to wait for this transaction to uh, commit and be written out to the blockchain. And once it does, then you'll see all the balances uh, displayed down below uh, that we have with these print statements right here. So there it is. So that's kind of the lay of the land and that's kind of like at a lower level. You have the ability to do really anything you want through the SDKs uh, and, and as well as uh, using PyTeal for the um, uh, smart contracts. Now uh, the other thing I want to show you here is our developer portal. We have uh, different sections for the official docs. We've got blog with uh, tutorials and, and solutions and articles and by the way uh, you can write your own and contribute and get some algos, right, uh, for doing that. So um, uh, that's a, something to keep in mind. Also, if you do create some tools, uh, let us know. You can submit a project here, and we'll go ahead and populate this page, which is, you know, all of these great tools, everything from Algodia to uh, Block Explorers, like I showed you, different wallets that are out there and so forth. The docs is the main thing you want to get started with, like getting started, for example, uh, what you can see here is you've got, you know, how will this, uh, you know, benefit me, blockchain. If you scroll down the, this entire page, you get down to the section here on uh, all of your uh, SDKs and uh, things of that nature. So really some great tools and uh, things that are available through uh, the developer portal, which is 
award-winning, I might add, for in the blockchain space. So a lot of great content there. Uh, let's talk about Reach next. So Reach is a programming language. It's a uh, JavaScript, uh, Python, more languages you can use uh, as well to develop these type of solutions. In addition to a programming language, it's a compiler, and you, it can output to, to any chain, like I mentioned. Um, it's just a configuration change to be able to do that. And uh, deploy, right? It'll go ahead and deploy to your, your blockchain that you want to as well. Now, there's two pieces to it, of course. You know, you've always heard the front end, back end, and we've had different names for this over the years, client server, or NTR architecture. It really boils down to separation of concerns, right? And what you can do now is interact between, you know, the front end where you got the functions and the back end that's going to call them. And um, basically, the focus is on the business logic, which is really nice. So it's, it's even at a higher level than what I showed you, for example, in that Python SDK example. Uh, and so what you get here is reach programmers don't need to think about things like contract storage or protocol diagrams or state validation or any network details really. And what the back end has then is basically it's a JavaScript like uh, reach code and um, it generates and deploys and interacts with smart contracts automatically. So it's not just a smart contract, you're really building the entire DAP you know, with reach. And also the, the solution implementation is, is in there. You know, what are, what's the logic behind your, your criteria, right? In the, in the uh, smart contract, uh, you define what your front end interfaces are. So you know how to talk to them. It's just a list of methods and properties for each one. Uh, you define the participants, who's involved, you know, in, in this particular scenario. And then you get to verification and commitments. Uh, and, and then on the front end, this is where you create your user interface, and this is where you can do things like create accounts or uh, have that actual interaction method logic in any kind of blockchain-specific code. Sometimes varies, blockchains vary by times of block, so if you're looking at, you know, waiting for X number of blocks on one chain, it might mean something on another chain. So you can put that, that blockchain-specific code in there, too, if you want to. Usually you don't have to do any of that stuff. You compile, run it, and then it deploys out to the Algorand blockchain. So how do you install Reach? Again, it's a Docker implementation, so download Docker, and then just curl the, um, this uh, Reach uh, executable into your project wherever you're going to be working at. Uh, if you're running on Windows, you just enable the Windows subsystem uh, feature for Linux. These are some handy commands uh, using uh, Reach, just uh, Reach updates, probably the one I use the most, and Reach run. And then, uh, so let's take a look at a sample uh, DAP walkthrough. So the first thing you want to do when you're uh, programming in Reach, do a Reach init. That'll g give you a hello world kind of uh, back end and front end for your uh, application. And in this, I'm going to go over the, this game called Mora. I have a few books to give out. My brother Gary actually wrote this book not too long ago. We had lots of uh, history, you know, about uh, Mora the game. And even uh, the back page of this has got... Uh, some of the old uh, family shots because they always used to play Mora, you know, always in the backyard playing at all the picnics and everything. So a little bit of uh, family nostalgia in there as well. But in any event, what Mora is there, if I'm unfamiliar with it, you shoot fingers with an opponent and you got to guess the number of total uh, fingers between the two players. So it's a fingers game. Uh, and it, right here, either, um, uh, so you got two, two players in this, uh, two, two participants, let's say Bob and Alice, and they're going to uh, go ahead and, and interact. So you got to look at the flow here. So on the right, you can see we got Bob and Alice are both participants represented by, you know, A and B. And this section here only pertains to Alice. And then this section here only pertains to Alice, you know, because you've got the A in front of it. And then there are times when you want both of them to do that. And the commit means it's done, right? It commits it out to the blockchain. And... Uh, this is the like the rules, the logic for the game. You shoot the fingers, you guess until there's a winner. You got to put this into a loop, right? So any draws you want to keep going uh, uh, after that. Now the front end, this is where you actually uh, like create the accounts. In this case, we're starting an account with a, bal a balance on, uh, on on DevNet, and then uh, this is where we go ahead and uh, create the contract on the back end by Alice, and then Bob's going to go ahead and attach to it. And then uh, this is the logic where you throw in the fingers, so it's just a math, a random math uh, application, and then you have the other one for uh, the guess, and then one for uh, printing out the winner. So let's take a look at, uh, at this uh, more application. Uh, when you first start out, you'll do a reach, 
init. And I already got uh, code in there, but this is what you would generate uh, as you see right here on the display up at the top. So the back end is basically this, this RSH file. And there just simply defines two participants and we're gonna run init to get things going and then we're gonna go ahead and publish uh, by each player and then exit. And then on the front end, uh, this is where we're going to um, import the library up here, the standard library from, from Reach. And this build, uh, index main MJS, this is actually built in this build folder. When you go to run it, it'll automatically generate. And that's where the teal ends up, or, or the Ethereum code would end up uh, over there in, in, that, in that file. You get a hash of it. Uh, so then uh, on the uh, front end, uh, we're going to attach, uh, create the, the uh, contract, and then attach to it from Bob, and then, uh, you know, uh, Bob and Alice are going to, you know, print out these messages. So if I do a reach run here, uh, you'll see all those print statements come out uh, from uh, the front end, okay? And so there you see it, right? So now it is, hello, Alice and Bob, launching, starting back ends, and goodbye. So that's your hello world. Now let's go into actually, uh, the next thing I did was I said, okay, I gotta get this logic working. Okay, and I'm gonna do a reach run here. And what this one's gonna do now is simply play, play one hand of this, one round of this, just to, just to make sure the logic's working. So you can see down there, Alice shoots two, Alice guessed up total of four, Bob shoots two, Guess the total of three. Alice, uh, actual fingers thrown is four, so Alice wins in one round, all right? But a lot of times when you run this, it was a, a draw. So I, I think I shortened the number of fingers to like three fingers to, to, <laughs> to make it win more when I was testing. But in any event, that the logic then for this is basically, if you go take a look at the back end, uh, so what we got here is, um, the player is defined as something that has a get fingers function, a get uh, guess function, C1, and what the outcome is, right? And then you also have um, the main routine here where we're going to go ahead and interact with the front end to get those, those fingers that we saw, the, get the guess, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, declassify those and commit those out to the blockchain. And then for Bob, then he's going to do the same thing, right? And then you're going to compare and then see what the winning numbers are uh, when it's all said and done. And this is the basic logic for the game uh, that you see there. So this is uh, good. This works, but it's missing the loop, right, amongst uh, a few other things, okay? So that, uh, let me uh, continue on with the deck, and we'll talk what those, about those other things are. I've been talking about verification and how important this is. There have been uh, times when uh, funds have gotten locked away forever, you know, with smart contracts if they're not done right. Because think about it, these smart contracts, they create an account. The smart contract is going to know what the passphrase is or the private key is. But as soon as that contract gets done, if, if that account is not, has, does not have a zero balance, you're going to lose those funds and you'll never be able to get at them again. All right, so that's why verification is very important. You want to verify that you now don't have any funds that were created in the uh, smart contract, have any funds left over when that thing is done. And that's what REACH will do for you. It does that verification process through a lot of mathematical proofs. All right, so that, that helps you protect, help, helps protect yourself against blockchain attacks. And then um, you do this, uh, the more assert statements you put in, the better because then it, that verification process is going to take those asserts into play as well. And now it does some verification on its own without any asserts, like the zero balance thing, but there are other ones that are more complex, like I should get a winner. Like when I run through my while loop, it should always return a winner, no matter how long it takes, right? So that would be an assert statement that would put in for looping through that game logic until there is a winner. Um, and auditing is very, very important, right, when you're building any kind of DAP. And typically you'd hire an auditor or something like that to make sure there's no holes in the application. And then uh, what you would do is, uh, you know, it's all good, right, after you've got this thing audited. But what happens when you make a change to it? You've got to re-audit the entire thing again. And so what REACH provides is a different solution, right? The compiler verifies it, number one, and if you do make changes, the auditor verifies 
you know, it, it, basically if you have enough assertions in your code to test everything out and then anything new, any code changes, well, you just need to check the right assertions were, you know, that they were inserted on the page. So the auditing process becomes simpler. And um, it, it's a, just something to keep in mind, you know, going forward when you're building these in production. Timeouts and non-participation. So timeouts is another thing you gotta look at. Um, uh, sometimes if you're, if you're building a solution uh, and um, it's, not, it's not like a web app, you know, where you can bring up a page and go there the next day and it's still in the same spot and you continue where you left off. There's timing that's involved a lot of times. Like if I'm making a wager in a game or something like that, you've got to accept that in a certain amount of time or, or, you, or the contract will be null and void and then you get out of there. So these are the types of things you got to look for uh, when you're building your solutions are these timeout parameters as well. And then reach, uh, it does provide a uh, platform specific code. So here we're saying, okay, if it's algo, then I'm going to use three rounds. Otherwise, I'm going to use 10. Uh, and then there's some flow commands like you saw uh, uh, partially uh, in some of the code. You have each, many, forks, parallel, reduce for things like auctions where you're hitting lots of threads you want to create. And then also um, uh, race and publish and pay. These are all uh, documented up on, on the, uh, the reach docs. So let's take a look at uh, verification. Okay, I'm going to do a reach init or reach run. All right, so reach is going to run, and, and I'm going to show you the code here. So here's some additional asserts. This is the one I told you about where all combinations of the fingers, right? There's the winner function, so you're going to pass in both players' guesses and both players' uh, numbers. And now it's going through, and it's doing the loop to determine, oh, is there a right guess or not? And you can see uh, there's a wager involved, too, in this process now. So I did a lot of different enhancements uh, for this. And then now the player function has, uh, you know, timeouts in it as well. And if you take a look at the, the main line, uh, another thing we did, uh, there it is, Bob wins at the end because he uh, threw five fingers, and that's what uh, his guess was, and she threw zero fingers. But it, there, was, there was one thing that we, we had a problem with in the last demo that I showed you was the fact that Alice published her information to the blockchain before Bob took his turn. Well, Bob would have an unfair advantage there, right? Because then they could see that uh, ahead of time. So what you can do uh, to um, alleviate that is salt the value and then uh, through this make, make commitment, and then, then uh, go ahead and uh, kind of write that one out, and it's 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 uh, decrypted, right? You can't really tell what's going on at that. And then after Bob makes his move, then you can go back and resurrect that and come back in with um, uh, the the there's a salted value. You're going to resurrect that, and now the check commitment will go ahead and unravel that and make it back to the original form. So the make commitment, check commitment, and you're probably using those. Also, you see I've got some timeouts in here. Uh, as well to handle, and then also there is a um, uh, logic down here to do, do the transfer. And let me go ahead and just change this to one, because right now both of them are wagering, so it's got to be two times the wager in to do the transfer. Now, if I try to run this, it should fail on the fact that I'm leaving money on the table. And this is the beautiful thing about Reach, is that whole verification process. So. Uh, there is the error right there. So if you go up here, you can see, okay, uh, this equal to zero, this would be equal to false. And you want that, uh, you know, to be true there when you get done to be equal to zero. So then on the front end, basically is what you have is, um, you know, just a, a more, more functions, more flow. You got the, all the fingers here and, uh, that's pretty much it, you know, in terms of the, uh, the application. Uh, there is a write-up I did uh, on the portal on uh, this entire solution, and it walks through uh, uh, kind of a deep dive in the solution write-up, so you can follow this and build this right as you go uh, as well. And so that was recently pushed up to the developer portal. And then uh, finally, you have the ability to do remote procedure calls. And basically, instead of using the, the library locally, like you, you saw me do here with the JavaScript front end, uh, is basically you want, what you want to do is um, uh, change that to RPC calls, which have these uh, uh, endpoints over here. So that's what you'd be calling to uh, access the libraries through RPC. And if you, you, know, not, you don't have a language uh, that's supported yet in RPC, you can build your own. It's fairly straightforward to do that. 
And these are some of the uh, environment variables you would need for TestNet. Uh, let's talk about pipeline. Pipeline is a great tool for uh, uh, building front ends uh, with uh, JavaScript and, and React as well. Uh, here you see examples of every step of the workflow for an asset from minting to deploying to opting in. They have buttons that are associated with those. All you got to do is set up properties, right? And uh, you're, you're rocking and rolling. If you want to show the, uh, the address and a QR code for it, there's a, a tool that does that as well. Uh, also, you have um, uh, your React components. You know, uh, if you're anybody doing React here, yeah, good number of you. That's good. So you got that covered uh, with this tool as well. And they do have a, uh, they took that more example that I had, and they actually wrote a React front end using their tools. So yeah, there, there's the URL for that uh, particular code there as well. All right, uh, let's get into the C Sharp and an extension. So now you just search on Algorand. We do a create project new. You'll see an Algo Studio entry there for console apps. So let's take a look at that. All right, so I'm going to bring up my Windows VM. So, for example, here, if I go to create a new project, I just type in Algorand, up comes your console app. You hit that, and it creates a new solution. All right, so I've got that already set up here. And so let's go ahead and show you what's involved with this one. So it creates a template uh, with some uh, smart contracts already in it, and they're written in C Sharp, okay? So we saw the equivalent type of thing with Python. Well, now you got the equivalent type of thing with C Sharp. So here's an example of a conditional contract where you're just going to take a, uh, a value, and you're going to say, okay, if that value is greater than or equal to 4, I'm going to log out the value 10. Otherwise, I'm going to log out the value 20. There's always an approval program and then a clear state program. Those are the two that you need to create a solution for a contract. Here's another example in here, which is uh, doing a transaction reference. And this is actually going to use ABI, which stands for the Application Binary Interface. So you can do little subroutines and call those uh, from other smart contracts. And that's what you've got here is you've got a subroutine that just returns a 10 another one here that returns a note, another one that just returns, this is a clear program, always going to uh, come back as true there, and uh, this is the, uh, the approval program, you're going to invoke the smart contract method, which is a wrapper that sets up the, um, the approval program and the clear program, so it really makes this nice and simple, and then you can see here uh, some of the other methods that are involved on that as well. And then you got a unary operator just uh, comes in, does some, some math and adds one to it. So in the main program, I'm going to go ahead and run this, and what we'll see now is in the uh, test, I'm going to do that conditional logic one. And I've already got some breakpoints set, so let me go ahead and continue with that. And so the first place we end up is in this contract wrapper, which is this, in this util uh, folder. And this is going to be uh, when you go to compile uh, an application. It's going to go ahead and get that approval program and the, the clear state program. And then you can see down here, it's also got things like deploying, which is going to write it out to the blockchain. Uh, funding is going to transfer some uh, funds. This is where you opt into a, a contract, right? You can't use it unless you opt into it. Uh, delete, uh, you know, uh, opt in, uh, delete app, clear app. These are all functions, utility functions that are in that uh, class. So I'm going to continue executing. Uh, now we're going to deploy it. And then uh, once this deploys, then what we'll see is uh, another breakpoint get hit when it gets back to that response. And uh, then we're going to actually see that succeed and uh, write out the fact that it did succeed. Now, if you take a look at the, uh, the sources here, or dependency, I should say, and we look at the analyzers, on the analyzers, there it is. So let's go ahead and continue. Uh, that's in the ABI code. If you take a look at the um, Algo Studio, these are all the error messages you can see on the right that would be uh, in the application. And then also at the bottom here, this is the actual teal that gets generated, and it's live. It's, it's live real time. As soon as you make a change in that, uh, that contract in C Sharp, it automatically generates uh, the teal. And there it is. So now we got our, our response. It looks like we get, we're good to go. Let's step through that and then bring out the... Uh, the message down below on the the window, and there it is. So now you've got that 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 go ahead and succeeded. So that gives you an idea. First time ever. What do you think of that, huh? C sharp. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's get back out to the deck. We'll wrap it up.
talking about the ecosystem and um, it's happening folks you know uh, does anybody remember here when visual basic.net came out show of hands a few of you okay for those that weren't around then or weren't aware of it at that time a lot of third-party controls came out and that's when visual basic flourished we had this great grid control from component one who i actually worked for for a while component one and Infragistics and uh, all these great tool vendors, Sync Fusion, they, they started creating uh, controls. And even right now, if you're creating Xamarin apps, right, there's controls that you can just drag and drop, set some properties, and you're up and running. It really made development very, very simple. And we're getting to the point where we have a really great third party market, right, building solutions for Algorand. And I'm very excited about this because. You know, history repeats itself, right? History, you know, maybe in a slightly different fashion, but this is exactly what was happening when we were attracting all these developers when I worked at Microsoft, you know, to start using VB.net because it was so easy, right? There were so many tools out there. I and mean, I showed you a bunch here tonight, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? There's a lot of other great tools out there that really help expedite this development process. So write about them, blog about them. You can contribute, writing blogs. We've got tools and, and, and systems like I showed you. Uh, we also have bounties. Uh, so if you go out to get Gitcoin bounty, uh, you can take a look. There's some out there for writing uh, tutorials about smart contracts, right? And so now you can start getting uh, paid uh, some money as well for some of your efforts for contributing to the community, which is kind of cool. And then also, uh, we have a new Twitter, uh, Twitter Dev Spaces, and it is um, Algo Dev. So go ahead and, uh, and follow us. We, um, uh, geez, the last Twitter Spaces we had, I, mean, I think we had over 1,000 people on. It was really cool. So uh, a lot of developer topics there uh, as well. And we have run a developer office hours. Look for this to be uh, start be being broadcast on Twitch and then uh, a few other social media platforms as well. So. Um, uh, really great content there too. Uh, we get a lot of good uh, developers in. I had uh, some folks from Tiny Man in, which is a AMA that was built with uh, with uh, for Algorand, and uh, and also we had the folks from um, Headline in there uh, showing us. So a lot of great things. So once again, uh, the developer portal, and then you want the the Discord uh, servers for Algorand and Reach, and um, in summary. Uh, what we see here is uh, we, we covered Algorand blockchain at a, a high level, right? We talked about layer one uh, accounts. Uh, uh, we talked about assets, you know, in the way of fungible, non-fungible tokens. Uh, you know, the, the, the non-fungible part is, is really exploding. Uh, I mean, it's all exploding, let's, let's face it. But, uh, the, 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 you know, you start looking at the industries like the music industry, Right. If you take a look at what a musician makes after all the middlemen take their share, it's really low. I saw something ridiculously low like on that, like in the in the teens or something. I just it was mind blowing. Well, really, the age has come now where we're trying to get rid of that middleman process and to make everything direct. And that's what's really attracting a lot of musicians now, as well as really having a good case for getting royalties on things that they do produce. Right. If it's out written in cast and stone on a blockchain, Right, and someone goes to use it, there's a royalty model now that you can incorporate. And we have a lot of things coming out on that as well. Also, you want to set up your development environment. I told you different ways to do that. Uh, sandbox is very key, getting started with that. Also, installing the SDKs. If you're using Reach, you just got to go ahead and uh, curl that uh, Reach executable down to the project you're working in, and you're off and running. We walked through a sample DAP that was written in Reach with uh, a JavaScript-like backend. Uh, multiple front ends could be done in Python, C Sharp, uh, Go, uh, uh, many different languages. Also, uh, we walked through the importance of verification in smart contracts and DAPs. When you're building those, you don't want to leave uh, funds in them and uh, lose those forever. Uh, we even went full circle and went out to the front end now we got with pipeline uh, UI controls. Another good example of that from the ecosystem, uh, some really great stuff. And then also Algo Studio extension for Visual Studio. I'm ecstatic about that. I was talking to Frank. He's the developer on this. So I've been working with him and he is going to, uh, he thinks he's going to have more templates by the end of uh, June. Uh, for uh, ASP.NET, uh, for web, uh, web template, also a Xamarin template and uh, maybe uh, maybe another template as well for different work so but the, the council one that gives you the spot and plus there is an SDK 
that you can use as well. There's a, look for the one that says Algorand 2. That's his. And that is the one that you would want to use if you're just doing a, like a C-sharp application or a Xamarin application right now. You can still call all those functions like I showed you in Python where you create the, the transaction and then you, you sign it and then you, you broadcast it. You can do that all in a C-sharp application today just using the .NET SDK. Okay, and then uh, the ecosystem is flourishing. I'm very excited about that. I do have a few books to give out. Who's uh, the youngest person here? <laughs> well, what's your age? Nine. Nine? Okay, and we're going to give you a more book. Okay, whoa. <laughs> I'm going to toss it to you, okay? Oh, shoot. Like All right, good, good. And I'll sign that for you, too, in the end. And I'm just going to toss one out to that side. You ready? Books coming, incoming. Oh, one more down over here. All right, that's great. So I want to thank everybody. I'll remain up here. If you have any questions, come on up. Thank you.